Welcome back, everyone. Uh, really excited. We have a repeat guest, Jesse. Welcome back. We ended uh, the first episode that we recorded on on base. We said we're probably going to have you really soon because I got I had the feeling that things were going to move really quickly, and here we are. So much has happened in base, but there's also so many questions that I have based on what has happened. So, anyways, mm-hmm. welcome back. Uh, really great to have you. Thanks for having me. Super excited to be here. And just for anyone that's listening for the first time, can you just give a little bit of background on on yourself, what you've been doing at Coinbase and just base like a one, two minute kind of intro for, for everyone's kind of background? Yeah, absolutely. So base is an Ethereum layer two blockchain. Uh, it's built to bring the next million builders, the next billion users on chain. Uh, it's incubating inside of Coinbase and then gradually decentralizing over the next few years. Um, in terms of my background, uh, I've been in the Coinbase orbit for the last almost seven years. Uh, I came in through an acquisition um, of a, a company I'd founded in, in kind of the early 2013 um, and then joined Coinbase in like 2017. I led all of our consumer-facing products on the engineering side for four and a half years. So Coinbase, Coinbase Pro, Coinbase Wallet. Uh, and then kind of starting in mid-late 2021, I um, took a step back from that role and took on a new challenge, which was figure out how to bring the business on chain. Um, you know, Coinbase was started in 2012 before smart contracts existed, before Ethereum existed. Um, and much of our business has been kind of centralized custodial for the longest time, um, even as we provided that gateway for people to buy their first crypto. Uh, but then just in the last few years with products like USDC and CBE and Coinbase Wallet, we've started to build more what I would call kind of natively on-chain products um, that use smart contracts. Uh, that are global by default, um, that are running on this incredibly powerful, you know, next generation platform for the internet. Um, and we kind of said, hey, how do we move from having 10% of our product portfolio be on chain to having 100% of our product portfolio be on chain over the next uh, decade? Uh, and that became my challenge. Uh, we iterated through a bunch of different uh, approaches for that um, and ultimately realized that in order to kind of make that transformation, we needed a platform. We needed a developer platform where we could build those use cases, where we could um, kind of re-implement some of the products that we had in this new new kind of infrastructure. Um, and we felt like if we needed that, then likely the rest of the world needed it too. And so thus began Base. Uh, we launched the testnet in February. Uh, we opened the mainnet up for developers in kind of early, mid-July. Um, we just opened up bridging. Uh, which basically means folks can start bringing in their funds. I think we've already seen something like 120 over 100 plus. million, right? Yeah, yeah. I was just looking this morning. It's like 120 million yeah. worth of uh, Ethereum bridged in. Um, tons of activity, tons of excitement. And Uniswap um, deployed, Sushi deployed, so many apps deployed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we yeah. we got some. Uh, it's going to come together on Wednesday. Um, yeah. uh, and so Wednesday is the public launch or today, if you're listening, today is mm-hmm. the, the public launch, um, on the ninth, uh, yeah. and, uh, we're kicking off, uh, on-chain summer, although on-chain summer has really been going, uh, for a long yeah. time. We're just joining the party. Um, and we're excited to kind of help bring the next billion people on chain. That's really our goal. You know, what's really exciting is, you know, of course, over so many years since Ethereum really existed and since DeFi started, there's been a whole suite of applications, whether it's DeFi, whether it's NFT platforms that have existed on chain. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you look at across a number of parameters and KPIs, the users are just not there, right? There's mm-hmm. just still a lot of friction to join these and, and you know, your, your mom and pop can't really just go on chain. And so um, how do you think about you know, your existing user base that is very familiar with, I mean, Coinbase is synonymous, at least in my mind, with crypto in the US and maybe other places. Yep. Um, with, if you're a normal user, what is the experience for that user to then interact on chain through base? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think historically, you know, for the last few years, what it's been is it's been um, a pretty complicated process where you kind of say, hey, I want to use this on chain product. Application, um, then you need to get a wallet, you need to fund that wallet, you need to kind of get Ethereum to the right place. Um, you need to pick what the right place is. Do you want to use this app on, you know, XYZ chain or uh, another one? Um, and that whole process can take, you know, minutes. It can take hours if you're you know, relatively unsophisticated. As we've been starting to build base um, and thinking about how do we kind of get that next wave of adoption, I think our goal has been um, to make it so anyone can go from zero to doing something meaningful um, in less than 60 seconds on chain. Um, And so that's going from having no wallet and scanning a QR code to having a funded wallet that can transact, you know, to, you know, buy your favorite on-chain song or 
sign up for an on-chain restaurant pass mm-hmm. or um, you know, participate in an on-chain community. Um, and all of that can happen in less than 60 seconds uh, in a few taps. Uh, and I think, you know, with the launch of base, we're going to be, um, we're going to be there. We're going to be at that, uh, from a starting point mm-hmm. perspective. There's obviously a ton more work that we, we need to do, uh, in order to get that less, you know, even lower, um, to make the experience even better, even smoother. Um, and inevitably there's going to be bugs, but I think that's really the North Star. It's how do we take away all of the complex decisions that one needs to make and one has to make about where they use these apps. And you know how they get funding in their wallet, and instead just make it dead simple, so that billions of people can actually come on chain. Is it fair to say that will the user realize that he's going on chain, or will it just be such a seamless experience where it almost feels like you're still part of the Coinbase like UI UX, and it's so familiar? But there's a whole set of security kind of a, things yes. that need to happen in the background. So yeah, how, how will that flow think- look like? I think that it's gonna it's gonna end up being a mix of managed experiences that are incredibly simple, and then um, more diverse, um, kind of rich browser base. It's not really possible to just curate and um, create first party experiences for every product. Um, you know, like and that that was really one of our insights with Base was um, you know historically Coinbase has really focused on building first party experiences. Right, we have a first party debit card, we have a first party borrow product. Um, we have a first party centralized trading experience. Um, but I think as we looked at what was required to bring the next billion people on chain, what we saw was, well, that's going to require like millions of apps. <laughs> it's going to require like tons of things that maybe we can't even predict. And it, if we want those things to thrive, we need to figure out how do we actually create a platform for those things to be built, but then how do we also integrate that platform into our consumer experiences so people can use them? And so I think we're, it's going to end up being kind of that mix where we do have some of those kind of highly integrated first party experiences, but a lot, a lot of our focus is on empowering developers um, and letting kind of everyday people use these incredible products that are starting to be built on chain. How, uh, and this is where I want to go actually, and uh, as a continuation to that statement, like how opinionated will you be? Um, around the type of applications and the type of services that deploy on base. I mean, obviously the extreme of this is like the app store and Apple, right? Which is super controlled and they extract a lot of rent and, and, mm-hmm. and they, they just are very restrictive at times and it's a monopoly. And, and so where in that continuum will you be uh, and how opinionated will you be on the type of things that the user can and the type of apps that the user can interact with? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when we look at the kind of next generation of the internet, which we think is being built on chain, um, I think we believe that it should be open uh, and that it should be permissionless uh, and that it should be a place where there's no kind of like single party that's curating or controlling or dictating what can and can't be done. Um, and so base is open and permissionless. Um, people will be able to put any, anything on there. Um, you'll be able to build dApps of all kinds. Um, I think there's a balance um, that, that we're going to need to strike between base and Coinbase, right? I think base is going to be kind of this open, permissionless, you know, experimentation ground that supports creativity, that supports innovation, that enables kind of, you know, a, a thousand flowers to, to bloom. Uh, and I think that's going to be the role of Coinbase and other folks who are building kind of interfaces for everyday folks on top of base to help build tools and services that allow folks to distinguish, you know, which of those flowers do we want to smell versus not. Um, and we already have been building this on Coinbase. You know, if you go to um, the Coinbase product, you'll see dApps, you'll see ratings and reviews, um, okay. you'll see uh, kind of uh, uh, warnings if you try and interact with something that's high risk. Um, and so I think that balance is really how we think about it. It's like base, open and permissionless because that's what enables the global on-chain economy. That's what enables kind of the most innovation. Coinbase, more curatorial, um, more kind of focused on providing a trusted experience um, and ensuring that the, the the products and apps that we show to our customers um, are really ones that they know they can interact with with confidence. Would it would it be fair to say like uh, like you can use Google search and you can enable like safe browsing and some, some yeah. permissions? Would that be a good analogy in terms of if you're going through Coinbase itself and interacting and entering base, you may just see kind of like a curated, validated reviewed kind of peer reviewed apps that are yep. deemed safe to interact in a certain extent. Yeah, I think that that's a great I think that's a great analogy. You know, I might not say like it's going to be all the way to safe browsing. Like you know, right. you can use Google with safe browsing and not safe browsing. You can you're right. going to be able to use Coinbase with safe browsing and not safe browsing. 
Um, I'd say like the analogy, the Isabel's analogy is like the internet and Google, right? Where it's like the internet and Google safe browsing, where base mm-hmm. is going to be like the internet. Like, you know, whether you see finding Google or not, there's the internet is chaotic and diverse and uncontrollable. Um, mm-hmm. And then folks like Google or Facebook or Twitter, or whoever it is, um, do really try and build experiences that, you know, uh, do not direct users intentionally to kind of the, the more risky parts of that. Yeah. Well, let's talk about a little bit about the bridge. Obviously, that's opening up. Yes. We're recording on the 7th. Um, it's opening on the 9th. So let's talk a little bit about that. Like, what are you, yep. uh, what are the ways to bridge? Uh, why don't we start there? Yep. And we actually opened the bridge last week. So we opened the bridge on the 3rd. Um, uh, and then the main kind of opens for everything and everyone on the 9th. Uh, and so the reason why we kind of did this two-phased approach, and really it's been a three-phased approach, is we're trying to just be incredibly deliberate in how we rolled out this network. Um, this is the first time you've ever had a um, kind of large public company build a decentralized open blockchain. Um, and it's the first time that many of our users are going to be exposed to this. And so ensuring that we kind of move in a really thoughtful measure um, approach felt really important to us. And so, uh, like I mentioned, on July 13th, we opened it up for developers. Um, that meant that folks could start building apps on base. They could start deploying smart contracts. Infrastructure providers could start getting stood up. Um, we then gave them kind of a few weeks, basically, to get going, to get the first wave of applications started. Um, then we opened it up for bridging last Thursday. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can bridge. You can go to bridge.base.org. That'll let you bridge Ethereum. It'll let you bridge USDC. It'll let you bridge other assets. Um, You can also go to onchainsummer.xyz. That's kind of the landing page for uh, Onchain Summer, which is kind of all this incredible activity that's happening on chain this summer. We're doing a little curating there to kind of give people one thing every day that they can do on chain that's going to make their life better, bring them joy, uh, make them laugh. Um, uh, And there's a bridge experience there. Uh, that enables you to just quickly bring ETH over to get ready for that. Uh, that's a really cool one. Uh, that's probably my favorite one. Very interactive. You get to like feel like you're teleporting to the next generation of the internet. Um, and then we've also seen um, a bunch of kind of third party folks build bridging interfaces. So there's a product called Mint.Fun. Um, you can mint an NFT on uh, Ethereum there and it will automatically give you some Ethereum on base. Um, I think that's really cool. Uh, that's like a really fun user experience where you both get a new kind of on-chain piece of art and you bridge funds to this new world. Um, and then we've seen folks like Galaxy and Layer 3 also kind of build more hands-on guided uh, tours where it's like, here are these steps that you take to bridge your first kind of Ethereum to base. Um, and so the the reason why we kind of went uh, kind of broad in enabling bridging experiences, we want to reach as many people as possible. Um, well, again, our goal is to bring a billion people on chain. And so some folks are going to be really interested in doing that through, you know, the consumer experience that feels like on chain summer. Some are going to be more interested in doing it through like a dedicated NFT experience like Mint.Fun. Some want the like maximally powerful bridge interface that lets you kind of configure everything and uh, mm-hmm. feel like you're really in control. And so yeah. making sure that we're widening that aperture and bringing as many people in as possible felt really important to us. And for like the perhaps uninitiated listener, it, it's important to talk about bridges because one part of the equation is m- moving a lot of the apps that already exist, um, you know, Ethereum and various L2s. I mean, you're built on the OP op- optimism stack. So, yep. but not only that, but just if you're interacting in Ethereum L1 or any other L2 or, you know, perhaps other L1s, then you can bridge. Um, your assets to interact and base. Um, talk a little bit about the developer experience. Um, you know, there's a whole host of apps that already exist out there. How yep. easy is it for them or how easy has it been based on what you've observed the last month for them to deploy on base? Yeah, incredibly easy. You know, base is EVM equivalent, um, which means that you can literally run the same apps you're running on Ethereum um, on base. And so as we've gone out to folks, um, you know, for most folks, it's been, oh, this is this is really straightforward. I was just talking with someone um, last night. And I was like, hey, we've been seeing a lot of demand for the, the piece of kind of like the infrastructure that you guys are building. Um, and they're like, oh, we'll just deploy it tonight. We'll deploy it tonight. Um, and now it's available on base. Uh, and I think that this is kind of a superpower of what's happening in Ethereum right now and happening with the OP stack and happening with the EVM, which is that when you have um, kind of standardized technology, um, you can like, move more quickly to build out these ecosystems. Um, and, and, you know, base, we will go from kind of zero, nothing on the blockchain to um, more than 100 dApps 
uh, which is that that's kind of what we're going to get to announce on Wednesday. More than 100 dApps that are live um, with more coming. Um, and, you know, this incredible on-chain summer experience where every day there's going to be something novel to do. Um, and if you think about that, like speed, that, that's incredibly fast to do all of that in a month. To get all these pieces of you know social infrastructure and financial infrastructure and media infrastructure and have experiences that people can actually interact with um, right at the beginning of the kind of birth of this new ecosystem, um, I think that that is a testament to EVM. It's a testament to Ethereum. It feels a little bit like a magic trick, um, but it uh, is really the result of almost you know seven years of hard work building this infrastructure and getting it ready for this next phase. What do you think about like the next six, 12 months look like? Uh, you know, you can certainly have a lot of the existing users and apps bridge into base, but I think the more skeptical person would say, well, that's not a lot, right? In terms of yeah. users, um, what do you think the composition looks like for the really the new users that have never interacted on chain? And where do you think they're going to gravitate to which kind of apps and kind of the retention and the engagement that you're going to see on, on base versus maybe other uh, L1s or L2s that just haven't seen that continued engagement. You know what I mean? Like it yeah. sort of drops off pretty dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I hear that. I'll also say if you look at the um, number of transactions and number of transacting users on L2s over the last year, it's basically just like up and to the right. Um, like looking at L2B, um, look at TVL, you look at activity, you look at unique transacting users. We are, we're consistently growing uh, pretty, pretty much month over month um, uh, across the whole L2 ecosystem. And so like my general feeling is we've started the growth curve for adoption that will not stop until the entire world is on chain. And so the next two years are going to be that growth curve accelerating. Um, and that acceleration being driven by more real use cases that aren't just speculation, aren't just financial, um, but that actually mm -hmm. provide kind of real value to folks um, every day. And so, you know, when it comes to base, I think a lot of what we're interested in and, and focused on is um, uh, kind of like consumer products and consumer use cases. Uh, some ones that come top of mind to me is we have Parallel, which is, you know, really like an incredible um, gaming studio that's built a trading card game that's fully on chain. Um, they're also building a full kind of AI powered um, MMORPG called Colony. Um, and uh, they're building it all on base. Uh, and so that's going to be this kind of entry point for, you know, folks who are really into gaming to come on chain uh, and then, you know, do a ton of exploring from there. Uh, we have Blackbird um, building on base that uh, is founded by Ben Leventhal, who created Eater and Resi. Um, and he's back for a third one, uh, building a fully on-chain restaurant uh, kind of subscription and loyalty platform. Um, the experience is crazy. You know, you like walk in, you tap your phone at the restaurant. They instantly know who you are. They, you know, handle your it's all handled through the app. You can sit down, walk away, whatever you want. They bring you special things. Um, you know, I, I think these kinds of experiences that are uniquely enabled by this new on-chain platform, um, but are, again, not just speculation, they're actually real-world utility. Um, I think that's what's going to bring um, kind of this next wave of users over the next couple of years um, that will be more sticky, um, that will... Uh, you know, kind of show the world, whoa, this is this incredibly powerful platform, kind of like the dawn of the internet um, that's starting to take shape that is going to onboard, you know, billions of people over the next <laughs> decade. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, that's what we're excited about. Obviously, the financial stuff will come too. Um, USDC is a huge part of our, our strategy. Well, say, yeah. um, uh, those pieces are, are coming, but I think we, we think we need it all. Um, we think we yeah. need all those pieces to bring in the diversity of ecosystem that's going to really uh, enable us to grow. That's really interesting. Like the the restaurant reservation, for instance, is is really cool because everything it's sort of like very integrated. Like you have yeah. seamless checkout with USDC, right? Which a user would already have. You get the points. Maybe you have an NFT tied to that loyalty for that particular restaurant. Every time yep. you go, you get a different NFT. Yeah. Um, so all that seems great. What about the privacy of that? Like if you're a user and you end up going to say one restaurant, but then you go to other restaurants, like my, you know, that restaurant might be able to see your entire purchasing behavior and interactions. And that poses some sort of interesting privacy um, questions. So I'm curious to get kind of your thoughts around that. Yeah, I think that um, absolutely. And if you look at like kind of the, the history of, um, you know, restaurant in general, this kind of engagement, I think you'll see that many people are comfortable with, 
uh, having kind of a lot of that information public, like your Yelp reviews and your check-in history on Foursquare. Um, but there's a lot of people who also aren't. And I think generally privacy is kind of one of the next big uh, problem spaces that we need to take on as an industry. When I look at what kind of we've been building towards, the, the three ones that we've been most focused on, I've been most focused on are driving down the costs. Um, and that's really what we're doing with layer twos like base, um, reducing costs from, you know, a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars to do something to sub ten cents. Um, and then eventually sub cent. Um, the second is building better wealth experiences. Um, so that people can actually use these technologies. And I think you're starting to see that kind of finally get to a usable place with products like Coinbase Wallet and Rainbow and the Coinbase app. Um, the third is identity, um, where I think we really need a real sense of identity on chain. Um, and, you know, that's again starting to emerge with things like WorldCoin. Um, Coinbase is also working on some products here that can be rolling out natively on base in the next couple months. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think like now that we've kind of gotten a grip on those, uh, which I really felt were kind of core building blocks in order to enable this next wave of applications, I think we then now need to turn our attention to privacy. Um, mm-hmm. And it's been cool to see a lot of research happening there. Um, you, you've seen Vitalik kind of leading the way, talking about stealth addresses and what we can do kind of without having to do massive protocol changes to Ethereum. I think there's a ton of um, really, really interesting opportunity there. Um, and I expect that over the next one to two years, we'll be able to, um, if not fully solve, um, you know, mitigate a lot of the largest kind of privacy concerns and have paths to fully solving them. Hey everyone, we'll get back to Empire in just a minute. But before we do that, I want to let you know that we have Permissionless coming up. Permissionless is a big conference that Blockworks and Bankless put on together. It is the biggest, the best DeFi conference in crypto. This year, it is in Austin, Texas, September 11th through 13th. If you've been in crypto for a while, you know that bear market conferences are the best kind of conferences. We have a phenomenal lineup of speakers. A lot of the guests that you hear on Empire are both going to be speaking there. You will have the opportunity to meet them there. And a lot of the topics that we cover on Empire, ZK Tech, Rollups, Account Abstraction, MEV, App Chain Thesis, A lot of that kind of stuff that will all be discussed at Permissionless this year. So because you are a listener of Empire, you get a special discount. That's right. Santi and I negotiated with our marketing team. You get 30% off if you go to blockworks.com forward slash permissionless. Empire 30 is going to get you 30% off your ticket. Today, when I'm recording this, that's about $300 off your ticket. So type in Empire 30 when buying your permissionless ticket, you get about 300 bucks off. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. It's in the show notes. Do it quickly because prices go up all the time. And if you are going to Permissionless, hit me up. Let me know. Shoot me a DM on Twitter. I would love to meet up with you there. You know, one of the things that I want to touch on is kind of how do you see the monetization model and how impactful Mm -hmm. base can be or will be in your mind to the general business model of Coinbase, which has historically been you know, an exchange that relies on a number of fee streams, but predominantly had been trading fees, then some custody and um, and then now a bit of subscription. But base can be fairly profitable. You look at just the profitability of L2s by themselves. So I'm curious how you think about the overall monetization of Mm -hmm. base and how impactful it can be for um, Coinbase's overall business model. Yeah. I think when we when we look at base, the primary and, and think about monetization, the primary lens that we look through is um, not base itself, but how does base enable the next wave of use cases that grow Coinbase and grow Coinbase's ability to monetize? And where that comes from is if you look at what Coinbase you know has done historically, um, and you kind of t- t- take through a few of the monetization streams, you know, uh, trading, um, custody, uh, you know, uh, savings today with USDC, uh, staking. Um, all of those are kind of like crypto economic verbs that Coinbase has made really easy to do. And in exchange for making it really easy, in exchange for doing that in a fully trusted way, we, we've seen that folks are willing to pay um, because they value that trust. They value that ease of use. And I, I think that our general perspective is those are still a really small number of use cases, right? We're talking like two to three things that people do right now with crypto. And with what we're doing with base is we're basically going to widen that aperture. And so there's going to be hundreds of things for people to do with crypto. And in that world where there are hundreds of things that that people can do with crypto, um, Coinbase is going to continue being able to provide that trusted interface on top of it. And they're going to benefit from having kind of more things to do, 
that can you know have more interfaces built for them they can take more fees by basically doing it in a trusted way. Um, and so I think it's really about kind of growing the pie um, mm-hmm. of what people do on chain and then finding ways to monetize that, that and trusting that if we grow the pie, if people are transacting and living more of their lives on chain, um, that's going to end up being a kind of lucrative, a really lucrative thing for, for Coinbase. Because nice. ultimately, they're still going to have to use Coinbase itself, the exchange for on and off ramp um, yep. and, and, and maybe staking or whatnot. Yeah, and I mean, and they're going to use Coinbase and Coinbase Wallet to actually access these dApps and use right. these products, right? Like, if you look at Coinbase Wallet today, like, and Coinbase, you can trade via Uniswap, mm-hmm. um, uh, and that's you know us providing a trusted interface. Um, folks, maybe don't even know that Uniswap's there behind the scenes, um, but uh, it gives uh, customers access to way more kind of opportunities. Um, mm-hmm. And so, I think it's going to be that Coinbase kind of becomes this gateway. Uh, or interface for this new on-chain economy. Um, and that owning that relationship with the kind of the everyday person, um, the user is going to be uh, a really good place to be. Um, yeah. yeah. How, uh, at a, a top of your head, now that you mentioned Coinbase Wallet, like how many, what percentage of like the overall user base of Coinbase, maybe Coinbase Retail, uses Coinbase Wallet? I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. Um, but I will say that I think like Coinbase Wallet is um, where a lot of our kind of like on-chain native, uh, on-chain forward customers are transacting um, because it's really built first and foremost for that on-chain product suite. Yeah. Yeah. I was just trying to think of like what the conversion rate is going to be of the total like Coinbase users, really retail in a base. Um and how different will that be relative to kind of like just purely Coinbase wallet, which Coinbase yeah. wallet was just like, Hey, here's a wallet. You can use it and then just go and venture, which still feels like it's pretty daunting, right? For the normal yeah. user. Whereas base just feels more of a, here's an app store, an ecosystem, kind of like how the iPhone was preloaded with some apps yep. just to like give users some ability to just start using stuff and then get yeah. more familiar. Yeah. So I'm yep. just trying to. Well, you know, I think similar to the way that we um, thought about kind of having many bridging interfaces, uh, I think we, we also believe that it's going to require many user interfaces to base to, for people to get kind of comfortable using this next wave of applications. So obviously Coinbase Wallet, that's going to be kind of more sophisticated users, although I think it's getting easier and easier literally every day. Um, you know, like as part of this uh, base effort and the on-chain summer effort, um, we have taken an onboarding experience that used to take, you know, a few minutes, five minutes plus um, and have, you know, more than 10 steps. And we've condensed it down to literally one step. So you set up mm-hmm. your phone, you face ID, you, you download the app, you face ID, you open it and, and it opens up with a configured wallet that you can start transacting with. Um, and so I think that Coinbase wallet is going to get easier and easier, but it's also still kind of on the more sophisticated side. The, the, the other side in Coinbase, we have uh, the Web3 wallet, which is a fully powered crypto wallet um, that can transact on base, that can use all these dApps, that can um, you know, do DEX swaps, can, can do literally anything that Coinbase wallet can do. But the key management model is slightly different. So Coinbase does it in a semi-custodial way um, mm-hmm. where uh, the kind of shards through MPC are split across your device and Coinbase servers. Um, and there's a recovery process if you lose your device. Um, mm-hmm. And that is an entry point where it's just alongside the Coinbase app. It's in the Coinbase app. So if you're just someone who's only ever traded before using the centralized exchange, but you see, hey, oh, here's this asset that I can't access on the centralized exchange, but I want to trade. You can just jump into that and it's super easy. Or if you see, hey, here's this on-chain summer experience I want to do, but I've never transacted on chain, you can just jump into that wallet again. Mm-hmm. And so I think those are two experiences that Coinbase provides. You know, base is even bigger than Coinbase, right? We also have Rainbow and we have Rabi and we have Trust Wallet. Right. We have, you know, all these folks who are building interfaces mm-hmm. that enable people to access this economy that's starting to grow. And yeah. so as you know, the next year kind of happens. And as these use cases mature, I expect we're going to have a whole spectrum of like, Mm -hmm. this is fully handled for you um, to like, you are deep in it. Um, One Mm -hmm. other experience, which I didn't mention, which I think we've talked about. Yeah, never mind. We were building a ton of institutional experiences as well to make this really, really easy. Um, Because, you know, it's not just everyday consumers who are trying to figure this out. It's also institutions, institutions, yeah, right? Who are like, how do we transact on chain chain and make that really easy? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I remember using Fireblocks, uh, but it was, I mean, I think it's it's fairly clunky or was. I mean, it's not perfect. Um, So really excited. Uh, At the right time, you can talk about that. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I mean, we've been using them internally for base. We've been like mm-hmm. kind of de- dog fooding and demoing, and it's it's, it's epic. It's it yeah. feels like you know if you just have a really powerful crypto wallet, but then it has all of the institutional security, trust, everything behind the scenes. Yeah. So uh, we've loved it. Really exciting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about like I remember in the early days using Coinbase way back in the day. Like you, you would be getting like for every referral you got like some very like ten dollars of bitcoin back in the day ten dollars of bitcoin yeah. and that ended up being you know like over a hundred or more depending on when you got in will there be some i i i know there's a whole host of grants that you guys have disclosed but also other organizations like Geese global has like 125k prize pool and hackathons yep. will there be um incentive for users to start interacting on base so so if you have a coinbase account say hey we'll give you x depending on certain activity and different apps like yep. is there like some sort of incentive or will be yeah yeah absolutely um and there, there already are today we, we started experimenting with these with um opening of bridging so in the coinbase app and in coinbase wallet there's quests um if you bridge uh, uh ethereum to base you get a little eth on top um, you know, enough for a kind of like 10 to 15 transactions um, or kind of like one to two NFT mints. Um, and so that's kind of a first experiment. We're not just experimenting with that with Coinbase products. Um, we have similar uh, kind of incentives that we've done with Layer 3 and Galaxy, uh, mm-hmm. where if you go through their flows, you can earn a little bit of ETH, you know, enough for 10 to 20 transactions. Same with Mint.Fun, um, where if you kind of mint this bridge NFT, uh, you get a little ETH at the end. And so I think we're kind of in the like early stages of experimenting with these incentives. As kind of the summer gets going and as um, we start entering the fall, we also have a bunch of um, folks who are really excited about accessing kind of uh, Coinbase Mm -hmm. customers through base. And so it's not just going to be kind of base that's running incentives to get people onto base. It's also apps on base (laughs) that are going to run incentives to get users to transact in their apps on base. I think this is the really... Um, powerful thing about this flywheel is we are building um, an ecosystem where you're going to have uh, you know a thriving economy of apps who are looking to grow um, are willing to to kind of spend for that growth and that's going to bring in more users. Uh, Coinbase has this kind of incredible pipeline of users who are you know ready to get activated, ready to come on chain, um, mm-hmm. and that's going to bring in more apps. Um, and we're going to kind of gradually grow the number of builders and number of users uh, until we have you know a million builders, a billion people on chain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really exciting when you think about it. You guys have over, last time I checked, over 100 million users and over 10 million actives. And so that's like huge if you're any app out there. I mean, the, the it's so enticing to be able to tap into that that uh, consumer base and also institutional base. So yeah. there's really no reason why you wouldn't want to deploy on base. Like, Yeah. I think that's that's kind of what we've seen pretty consistently. Of course, it's going to take time. You know, like this is this is our first time figuring out how to build these systems uh, to kind of plumb through users and make it uh, uh, kind of work. And I think importantly, it's going to take work on the app side to make really high quality apps that people actually want to use um, and to integrate those experiences. And so, you know, I don't think we're going to snap our fingers and have 10 million people or 100 million people on chain overnight. But I do think that we um, have this incredible foundation um, that uh, is going to allow us to, over the next couple of years, bring in not just those folks, but literally the whole world um, mm-hmm. uh, to start to experience these incredible you know, new use cases, but also just the, like, uh, the in- incredibly powerful uh, the reality of what on-chain means. I mean, I was this weekend, uh, we, were, we were opening up base for bridging. We decided to do that um, in Idlewild, California. Uh, at FWB Fest, which was a really intentional decision. We brought our whole team into the woods to launch base. Um, and we did that because we felt like it was important to be like surrounded by something bigger than just the base team at Coinbase, like surrounded by culture, surrounded by people who were thinking about this space in ways that were really different than we might have been thinking about at Coinbase. And one of the most um, inspiring conversations I had as I was talking to an artist, um, a musician, and she was telling me, she said, since I came on chain and started putting my music on chain, my life has changed. Like I earn more money. Mm-hmm. I have more economic freedom. I'm able to have more reach. And it's not just me. Like as I brought my collaborators and friends on chain, um, their lives have changed. Yeah. And that's not an anomaly. 
that is the result of people moving from a system where the uh, kind of economics and the, the, the controls and everything is, is, is managed and controlled by a small number of players who, for the most part, are extracting value from the folks who are creating the, the incredible brilliance of the internet to a system where when you build something on chain or you create something on chain, it's yours. Right. And the value flows to you. And you maintain your autonomy. You maintain your sovereignty. And so I think that over the next few years, what we're going to see is we're going to see people start to make that switch and we're going to see their lives start to change. And that's going to be this incredible feedback loop where it's like, oh, if I move on chain, I live a better life. Let me tell my friends. Let me tell my family. Um, let me show the world that this is a better better way to live. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I think uh, the common criticism is this is just pure financialization and speculation, which inherently is not bad. I mean, like every like technological revolution relied on underneath all of that underpinning 100%. that was like speculation. Right. But like when you look at the stories of creators and NFTs are always a great example that it's so relatable to people because you then touch on how benefit, how powerful it is, this idea of having digital scarcity and be able to provably create digital work and content, claim it as yours and then monetize it without right. having to go through a gallery or you know, because it's been super challenging for so many artists that if you're not in New York, if you're not in these hubs, and it's increasingly hard to get discovered and interact with your core audience, right? So I think that, uh, I mean, a lot of like we have a regulatory pod here, and time and time again, the, the question, the, the, the criticism is always we need to show more actual like use cases, right? And the prime example of that, like Uber faced a lot of regulatory pushback, but it just became such a great product that you right. just like, it just overpowered. Right. And so I think we'll, we'll get there and I'm really excited to see these yep. kind of use cases in base. Um, I want to go back to one thing around identity because yep. I think it's such an important thing. I mean, you, we have world coin coming out and there's a whole, you know, you could argue if it's good or bad. Um, but one of the things that you do have is you have already KYC and, you know, a lot, every user that, as you've onboarded on Coinbase. Yeah. Um, and when they interact on chain, the big, the biggest issue on chain is like this idea of like civil resistance. Like <laughs> one user can have hundreds of wallets, right? And so when you right. think about rewards, like it's it's really hard, right? Yeah. Or has been to create like a kind of a cohesive like identity fabric for for on chain. Um, how will you guys play a role in that, given all the data and that you have already? from the, your existing users. Yep. Yep. And I, I think, you know, it's not just civil resistance. Yeah, I think that like civil resistance and being able to do incentives is a really important uh, kind of gap that, that identity can help fill. Um, but another one from my perspective is just um, like expanding what we can build from a product perspective on chain requires identity, right? Like if you look at the primary um, uh, kind of like lending product that is used in the United States, it's under collateralized credit card loans, right? And the only way people are able to get that is because of identity systems. And are those identity systems perfect? Like, oh, no, you have like a credit not. score, right? Which right, you have a credit score that allows you to get, you know, extended line of credit. Like, and I, you know, those identity systems are not perfect, but in order to even have the concept of uh, like a, a line of credit that's extended to you in an under collateralized way, you have to have some identity system because you have to know, are you a trustworthy person? Like, can you be relied upon to pay back that, that bill? Um, and so I think that that gap of identity is actually like holding back in a really significant way this next wave of use cases, even if it's just kind of similar use cases that exist off chain, coming on chain and benefiting from the efficiency, benefiting from the kind of low costs. Um, and so I, I think identity is super, super important. Um, in, in terms of kind of your question of kind of how is Coinbase going to play in this? Um, you're exactly right. You know, we have uh, probably, you know, one of the largest uh, kind of verified identity uh, kind of databases and, and users uh, in, in the world uh, from a kind of crypto perspective. And so what we want to do is we want to unlock those people to be themselves on chain. Um, and that means building products that allow them to bring their identity on chain in a you know, private way, um, allow developers to access that identity on chain so they can build new experiences like, you know, like the products we were just talking about. Um, and, you know, build better incentive uh, systems so that they know they're kind of rewarding and attracting uh, real human beings. 
Um, and, and we're doing that really quickly. You know, we have efforts in flight already. Um, you know, base is obviously mm-hmm. launching on Wednesday, but I think you can expect that we'll fast follow over the next couple of months with what we believe is, um, infrastructure that will enable that next wave of use cases by building and bringing better identity primitives. One thought is on that though, is that I, I don't think that these um, kind of identity primitives will be like monolithic. Like it's not like going to be, oh, Coinbase is going to identify everyone in crypto and that's going to be the way to do it. Instead, what you're going to end up having is um, kind of these pieces composed together. So you can have your Coinbase mm-hmm. identity on chain. You can have your world coin, world ID on chain. Um, there's going to be a bunch of other attestations that you can get. Maybe all these things are going to live in open Ethereum attestation service, uh, which we're really excited about. Um, Mm -hmm. And those are going to kind of combine together to create the fabric of who you are as an individual. Um, And that's going to be, it's going to be better for the world because it means that there's not going to be kind of one single point of failure, um, one single Mm -hmm. point of control, the like Equifax of, you know, the Web3, Web2 world who, um, uh, you know, you have to get on the phone with and call. Instead, there's going to be a bunch of different levers that you can to identify who you are on chain in a way that aligns with your values, um, that aligns with kind of what you you know want to show the world. Uh, I think that's going to be a huge positive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you think about it, your your credit score is really static and and doesn't. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many different parameters that you can incorporate to build a better identity model, and then and then feed that into DeFi and do a, a whole host of like set the interest rate and just think about like how riskiness you are as a borrower. I mean. It, there's, I mean, at the end of the day, blockchains are data rich. And so you can train models based on that data that are way far and beyond more efficient than like, you know, your, you know, social security or credit score, if you will. Yep. Um, it's going to be cool. It's going to be really cool. Yeah. No, it's, it's fat. And you attach an NFT to that and that, or like a zero knowledge proof. And like, so like all of this, like finally can come together. Right. Um, I want to talk about, you know, in this vein, like obviously we saw bald, which was like this meme coin that existed for like a few days. It was pretty crazy. It reached like 100 million market cap. Mm-hmm. Someone deployed it uh, with over 25 million of liquidity in the pool. And then poof, like the, the the deployer like rugged and like took away like probably 5 million. There was speculation that it was SBF from his parents' basement, all kinds <laughs> of stuff. And then the obvious question was like, and this goes back to my initial question around how opinionated you will be in controlling mm-hmm. this experience because at the end of the day, like it attracted a, a lot of attention and it's maybe not the right kind of attention that you want, but these things happen, right? Because you mm-hmm. you can't control these things or at least so far you guys haven't like clamped down on it. Is there a point in time where you, you do have an opinion on that and you mm-hmm. create a permissioned environment, if you will? for only users that have identified themselves and you have that ecosystem of apps and you kind of ring fence it to create a safer experience mm-hmm. or do you not do that and you just let it let it rip you know just if people want to deploy the ball 2.0 then that's it like it's a wild west yeah, you know, I think we've been I think we've been pretty consistent on this from the beginning when we when we announced base and as we brought it through testnet and as we brought it through developer preview and um, even opening for bridging. Um, base is an open and permissionless blockchain. It's like the internet. Um, it is like the internet. It is an extension of Ethereum, uh, and we believe that that open permissionless nature, uh, the open permissionless nature of the internet, uh, is the thing that um, you know, of course, always has some warts, but enables incredible creativity and it has enabled you know so much growth over the last 20 years and will enable so much growth over the next 20 years because we're going to have this open global economy that puts everyone everywhere on a level playing field and without that open permissionless nature we don't believe that we can get to that open global economy and think that that would be a real loss and so base is going to remain open and permissionless i think this goes back to the conversation we were having earlier about kind of what's the distinction between base and coinbase and how can those things interplay off each other I think, again, Coinbase is going to continue providing trusted, you know, easy to use experiences on top of base that help users interact with um, the things that are make sense for them, um, are going to kind of give them real value. Um, and uh, I think that's where kind of curation, um, that's where mm-hmm. filtering, that's where those things are going to fit in. I mean, I think yeah. that balance, um, not just between base and Coinbase, but, but between base and anyone who's building experiences on, on top of Coinbase, on top of base for everyday people, um, that's what's going to let us, like the internet, um, kind of have the unbridled creativity 
and also have the kind of trusted experiences that everyday people can um, rely on. Yeah. Because candidly, I mean, curation in my mind is not a bad thing. Like if you, if you have partnerships with, for instance, apps that you've independently, you or some, some trusted party or consortium has reviewed both at the code base level, right? Said, by the way, it's audited. It has these checks, like similar to DeFi safety score, which I think you guys were a part of, but yeah. yeah. still are, where like you may have partnerships with Uniswap as the preferred DEX, if you will, because, mm-hmm. hey, you know, you feel comfortable with that. Um, and the last thing you want is for your users, Coinbase users, to have a bad experience on base, because then that has a whole list of implications back to your main core business model that it at least is today, right? Hundred percent, and I expect, I expect that Coinbase will do that, and 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 that base will continue to remain kind of open, permissionless, new, incredibly mm-hmm. neutral, um, kind of supporting the the full ecosystem and helping it thrive. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, I think we're at the very beginning of what's mm-hmm. going to be a really exciting next decade, where um, there is so much creativity that comes on chain, um, and. I think there will inevitably be moments where folks are like, oh, this is scary or oh, this is um, risky. Um, but I think it's really important that we all kind of see beyond that and see, oh, this is a part of the creativity. This is a part yeah. of you know how uh, innovation happens. It's messy, uh, and we need to kind of see that whole spectrum. Um, and then we need to figure out how do we build and enable folks to build um, trusted experience that give the right kind of sections of that spectrum to the right users. Right. Um, I guess I also want to get your thoughts. There's so much happening in the Ethereum ecosystem, and you're mm-hmm. very plugged into that, like account abstraction and on-chain messaging and a whole host of things. But before we get there, maybe as a last question on base, and if you want to touch on other things, we can do that. But um, like, what kind of projects are you most excited about um, to see either deployed that exist already somewhere else or new kind of projects that you all feel particularly excited to be? to deploy on base. Yeah. I think that the things that I'm most excited about are like real consumer experiences, like apps um, that folks actually want to use. You know, I think Blackbird, Parallel, um, on-chain restaurants and, and food, on-chain gaming, um, on-chain media. Like those are things that I think have the potential to bring a billion people on chain. If you look at kind of the rise of different consumer applications over the last you know decade, whether it's TikTok or even ChatGPT, um, you see that once they kind of have product market fit, uh, they grow very quickly. They um, can go from having no users to having hundreds of millions of users, billions of users in the short span of time. And so I think that we're kind of at the point where we think the infrastructure is ready um, for folks to start building those products um, and that those products are going to be um, kind of uh, new and different and powerful in ways that people don't really understand. And we want folks to be building them on base. Um, and so if you're out there uh, and you're building a cool consumer product, a social product, um, uh, it kind of anything that you think has the potential to reach a billion people, come build with us on base. Um, mm-hmm. So I'd say that's one one audience. Of course, also really excited about the financial use cases. Um, we've been thinking a lot about kind of tokenized assets or real world assets and how we bring in that next wave of institutions. Um, I think that that will, will kind of be complex complimentary as well. Um, but definitely, you know, this summer, uh, really focused on those, those summary, you know, consumer use cases. And, you know, I, I guess the last thing I'd say before we, we pivot a little bit to Ethereum um, is if you're just getting started on chain or you're um, looking to dive in, um, join us this summer with on-chain summer. You can go to onchainsummer.xyz. Uh, every day, there'll be something interesting and cool to do. Um, starting on Wednesday, uh, base day one, we have uh, some cool uh, content to drop that's coming directly from the base team uh, that you want to you know participate with, um, uh, and then you know every day, literally including weekends, all the way through the end of August, there'll be one thing that we kind of curate, and then there's gonna be many things that are already just organically popping up across the base ecosystem, and we'll be showing it all off at onchainsummer.xyz. That's awesome. I want to get your thoughts on a lot of the what's happening in the Ethereum ecosystem, and then maybe as a as a segue, and as a lot of the talk about L twos has been, yeah, they've been super powerful. To your point, like you know, it's been hugely impactful in terms of engagement. But mm-hmm. one of the open questions is the sequencer and the decentralization of that said sequencer. At the moment, it's not right uh, mm-hmm. across any L two out there. How do you think about? The running the sequencer for base. Um, I've heard you talk about in the first episode, people should go back to listen to that. If I remember yep. correctly, at the moment, there's kind of no plans. It's just, it's going to be run by Coinbase and, and, and then TBD, what happens next, right? Uh, but I'm curious. Uh, I'd, say, I'd say it's more fleshed out than that. 
Um, today, Coinbase is running the sequencer um, in parallel. Uh, we've um, committed to this kind of open neutrality framework that we, we helped develop with Optimism called the Law of Chains, um, which kind of lays out how do we run the sequencer? What are the neutrality commitments that we need to make in order to continue being able to run the sequencer? And then also kind of puts us on a path to um, moving towards a world where we have decentralized sequencing um, and, and likely shared sequencing, where you have one sequencer that's sequencing many OP stack chains, including Base, including OP mainnet, uh, mm-hmm. Zora network, et cetera. And so um, we're just getting started on that journey. Um, the most recent milestone is uh, six weeks ago, we opened up a request for proposals um, uh, uh, via the Optimism Foundation, um, where we gave out a grant um, to uh, kind of do a first prototype of uh, a shared sequencer uh, set that would enable the next stage towards decentralized sequencing. Um, that prototype or that RFP was granted to an organization called Espresso Labs that's been building a decentralized sequencer set. Um, they're working on that now. Uh, and we're really excited to be collaborating with them. And so I think we're, we're actually making really solid progress. Um, it's the same thing on the ZK side. A lot of folks are like, hey, you know, is base an optimistic roll up? Like what's going on here? And I'm like, no, we're a roll up. We're going to have an optimistic prover, but we also just gave uh, RFP uh, to um, two teams, the O1 Labs team who built Mina, um, as well mm-hmm. as the Risk Zero team who's building uh, a Risk Five uh, ZK EVM. Um, and both of them are building ZK provers for the OP stack um, that will enable us to fully ZK prove the OP stack, get all the benefits from a finality perspective, from a security perspective, and do it in a way where we have actually multiple clients, um, which is going to increase decentralization. And so the way we think about base, the way we think about the super chain and the, this, this, this kind of technology stack that we're building is it's going to be built open source. It's going to be a public good. It's going to be contributed to by a large number of teams. You know, Coinbase mm-hmm. and base are the second core developer, but there's many core developers joining. Um, and that kind of team effort, the super team effort is going to lead to an incredibly powerful kind of technology stack that anyone can use to either run an L2 or to run an app chain. Um, and all of those things are going to come together to provide the bandwidth and the capacity that actually enables us to run applications at the scale that can onboard billions of people. Right, right. And people should go listen to because we recorded a great episode with Espresso and Celestia teams uh, yeah. to talk. If you want to learn more about sequencers, because some of this might be technical jargon, you should go listen to that. Um, yeah, I want to touch a little on on-chain messaging. I heard you talk about how important that is um and you've done an integration with xmtp can you just touch on on why you think that and kind of the relevance of that yeah absolutely um and i think this this also goes back to just kind of the the idea of everything moving on chain um that uh, we can move a lot of the products that have been off chain on chain and in doing that get um, better experiences and better outcomes for everyday people. Um, and I think a great example of this is on-chain messaging, right? If you think about um, kind of the messaging that most of us do, uh, you know, whether it's iMessage or Facebook message or Instagram message, um, today that messaging is siloed. Um, luckily, we've moved to a point where most of it is encrypted, um, which is great, but it's still controlled by one organization. Um, it generally doesn't have interoperability. So, for instance, you can't iMessage someone on an Android phone. You get the green dot blob and everyone hates the green dots. Um, and I mean, I do. I'm biased, right? Like, I want my message bubbles to be blue. Um, but, you know, with on chain messaging, all that goes away, right? You, you have encrypted messaging. But it's not controlled by any one organization. It's not locked into any one UI. So the messaging that you're doing via Coinbase Wallet and XMTP is also accessible in other apps like Converse or the XMTP web client um, or Lenster. Um, and I think over time, you're going to have more and more folks who kind of support that, that standard. And that means that users are going to be able to move their identities to different products. They're going to be able to eject if they want to. Um, and, and they're going to be able to benefit from having messaging on the same platform using the same identity as all the other things that are happening in crypto. And so, you know, you can just send USDC alongside the message on base. Um, and all of that just works and composes together. And so I think this is a great example of where we're kind of like, we're upgrading the system. Um, we're saying, hey, here's a bunch of kind of legacy systems that have shown us what's possible, but they don't work that well together. Um, uh, and now let's take those concepts and build them on this new on-chain platform and do it right and upgrade folks to that experience and deliver a bunch of value to their everyday life. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah, it really, in my mind, just takes one killer use case to really prove how beneficial it is to interact on chain. And I think some throughout this journey, a lot of people are just lost because either, you know, fees were really high at one point and they're no longer, but they haven't really cared to come up revisit yeah. uh, or they had a bad experience or it was bad on and off ramping. But I think people just touching on, on the development of Ethereum, a lot of people have like dropped the ball, not dropped the ball, but just lost interest at different points mm -hmm. in time, but they don't realize how far the infrastructure has come. Yeah. Um, so the merge was something that's super impactful. And I've heard you talk about that as, as kind of like something that is quote unquote, like, like likely top five most complex technical, organizational and incentive migrations in human history. Agreed. Um, yeah. I mean, that's this was me. like, yeah, yeah, that, that was, that was your quote. <laughs> Which, which I very much agree with. Like it, people yeah. like don't recognize how hard it was to agree on something and then, and then, and then upgrade an entire decentralized system. Yeah. I mean, it's huge from a coordination huge. standpoint. Huge. huge. Yeah, you know, I think that Ethereum will end up being is, is becoming one of the most important pieces of technology in human history. And the fact yeah. that we were able to even do that migration and, and land the impact of that migration, you know, the increased security, the you know, massive reductions in energy usage, which is okay. so much better for the environment, um, the like platform that we now have to develop further on. And so, yeah, it, it really an incredible achievement. And I think the, the even maybe more mind blowing thing for me about that is like, we're just getting started with Ethereum. You know, we've been working on this thing called EIP 4844 uh, for the last year and a half with Ethereum core developers and, and Coinbase and OP Labs. Um, and that's going to ship this fall, hopefully. Um, and it'll lower fees on rollups, the L2s like base by 5 to 10x. Yeah. And like, yeah. that's a year and a half of work that we've been putting in to make that happen. And there's a bunch of other upgrades that are happening to Ethereum in the OP stack that will, you know, similarly take time because this is a really, you know, complex piece of technology, but will, when they land, deliver massive, massive, massive impact that's going to mm -hmm. enable developers to build more cool products and enable everyday people to come on chain um, at lower costs um, with more, you know, interesting things to do um, until we have literally everyone on chain. Yeah. What are your thoughts on account abstraction? And, and just for general listeners, like how how impactful will that be for ease of onboarding and and just creating kind of these uh, experiences for users? Yeah, I think it's super super important. Um, I think that we're kind of right on the precipice of flipping to a world where most users' first wallets are smart wallets that are enabled via abstraction that give them much more flexibility, much more control, um, and enable them to kind of progressively increase the security, the, the um, power of their wallet over time. And so like a simple mental model of this is like, you can set up a smart wallet, the first kind of security on it is you can just have a phone number. So you verify with six digit code. Um, that's maybe a little bit more centralized. But if you don't have that much balance in there, that's fine. And then as you get, you know, $100 or $500, you can say, hey, do you want to add another signer to it for large transactions? So now you don't just need the phone number. You also need, uh, you know, an approval on your computer or whatever it is. There's going to be this way of us progressively upgrading the security model of these wallets, which I think is going to be really powerful. And then there's also going to be um, so much that uh, we can do from a just abstracting complexity perspective um, in yeah. terms of using those smart wallets. So whether it's bundling a bunch of transactions together so you can actually just do what the user wants rather than having to have them approve every single step. Every single step um, yeah. Or it's letting people pay gas in whatever currency they want. Um, so you can just pay with USDC if that's what's easy for you. Or if it's just subsizing gas entirely because you can kind of look and say, hey, this is a smart wallet that you know is a real human being that has an attestation. Um, and we want to encourage them to use our product. And the developer is willing to take yeah. on that cost, just like they've always been willing to take on the cost of running compute elsewhere. So yeah. I think that it's going to be huge. Um, I think Coinbase and Base are going to be kind of at the, the, the cutting edge of pushing it forward. And I think it's going to be a key lever for bringing the next billion people on chain. Yeah, I think so. And just at the, at the, at the, as, I, as I was hearing you talk about that, I mean, one of the things that we haven't touched on much in this episode has been just the, the importance of USDC as a kind of a fluid to like power so many different applications and just commerce. And people forget, but like if you're in the US, like it's not as tough, but if you're in, in other places, it's not as easy to like to do payments yeah. or to do cross-border payments and whatnot. And like USDC is huge in that and you guys play a huge part in that obviously and mm -hmm. so 
I mean, you can envision the growth of USDC as being one of the primary benefactors of just base and just increased activity. Going yeah, back to like, 100%. you know, how it impacts your business model, right? Yeah. So, uh, beyond just financial, like speculation yeah. use cases, right? Yeah. But so more it's, it's really things for people to do on chain. That's yeah. I mean, about. just the ease of convenience with account abstraction and just the logic of like subscriptions, for instance, like a huge problem with SaaS companies is the drop off in renewals just purely yeah. because the credit card didn't work. Does yeah. that problem goes away with, uh, USDC? You know what I mean? Like, and, and logic attached to that. Um, well, this is fascinating. I mean, I don't know if there's anything else you want to touch. I know we're to- nearing the top of the hour here, but um, it, maybe to recap for listeners here, uh, just action items this Wednesday. May- maybe just go through them. Um, yeah, this Wednesday, uh, base opens for everyone and everything. Uh, you can get started in the Coinbase app or Coinbase Wallet or Rainbow or Trust Wallet or any wallet. Um, come on chain summer.xyz uh, if you're looking for something to do every day. From August 9th through August 31st, we'll have one thing that's really fun, really cool to do on chain. Um, and then a bunch of other things that folks have built all across the ecosystem that you can go uh, explore if you want to go deeper. Um, if you want to use USDC, go for it. Uh, if you want to you know, swap, go for it. Everything will be there. Um, and so come experience what's happening on chain this summer. Um, really, really excited. That, that's kind of the primary call to action. I'd say the secondary call to action is um, it's going to take all of us to bring the world on chain. Right. This isn't a, a thing that Base can do alone or Coinbase can do alone or, you know, the, the folks we've been uh, kind of collaborating with can do alone. It's really going to take everyone who's in this industry working together to figure out how do we build that next wave of use cases? Um, how do we convince our friends, our family um, to give them a shot and to, to see the transformative power of this new platform? Um, and so I guess my ask to everyone who's listening is go build something. Go mint something, go create something, go drop it on base or on Ethereum or on OP mainnet or wherever you, you want. Um, but contribute, contribute to bringing the world on chain starting this summer. Um, because if all of us put our minds to that, um, it's going to happen faster. We're going to pull up the timeline. And when we pull up the timeline, um, that's going to have a massive positive impact on the world. So join us, um, get on chain this summer. That's awesome. Jesse, uh, I, as I said last time in, in the first episode, uh, it seems like there's so much happening in base and uh, we'll, we ought to have you uh, again sometime soon to have a recap. And I, I'm sure you'll be back. Uh, and, so uh, thank you. I'm excited to also see you guys at Permissionless. In, yeah, of course. Uh, in September. So Definitely. that's going to be an awesome event. You're, um, you're speaking, uh, right? Speaking there. Yeah. Uh, really grateful for the opportunity and yeah. grateful to be uh, continuing to build with y'all uh, okay. as we kind of bring the world on chain. Yeah, incredibly exciting. I think this is, I've said it before, but I think base is, you always kind of think about catalyst to reignite interest. Uh, and, and in my mind, this is, um, this is perhaps the most impactful thing in my mind to really onboard users. Cause there's so much, the infrastructure I think is ready. Um, and I think that there's a whole host of applications that people just haven't taken the time or interest because it's been hard to interact on chain. Right. And so you guys are really playing a central part in that and bringing you know, millions of people on chain. And so incredibly exciting. Jesse, um, thanks so much for coming on and, and sharing uh, more insights and really excited for, uh, you know, uh, uh, base summer. Awesome. Thank you. Right. It's on chain summer. Yeah. See you everyone.